the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Ah, the web tore. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's up, Timmy? This is how you deal with will! No! <laughs> not ah. my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within? Nothing. Rocket is in trouble, Akasa. Can can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. Hey, so before we get into today's episode, I wanted to let you know about a podcast that I'm pretty sure you're going to like that is called Bad Women, hosted by historian Hallie Rubenhold. And if you're like, I recognize that name, that's because I recommended her book a few episodes ago. She wrote a book called The Five that was about five of the women who were killed by Jack the Ripper. And her podcast, Bad Women, expands on the same stuff that she talks about in her book. So on Bad Women... Historian Hallie Rubenhold uncovers the real lives of Jack the Ripper's victims, revealing the discrimination that put them in his path, the same sort of misogyny women still face today. This show challenges established theories about the murders, causing many supposed Ripper experts to see red. Find Bad Women wherever you get your podcasts. Like where you're listening to this, you can find Bad Women that same place. Welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster, and this is a third Halloween super special. And the topic for today, the the Tits Out Brigade on the Patreon. Oh, I haven't said this in the podcast yet, but I did an official poll. And I say official because... I think it was official. So on the Instagram page for Vulgar History, which is at Vulgar History Pod on Instagram, I did in the stories a bit ago, uh, I thought it was time. We've done however many episodes of the show, like 30 or whatever. And I decided I wanted to have a name for all of you, the listeners. So I asked people on Instagram for suggestions and I got conveniently 16 different suggestions. And then we had a tournament where... 
it was like a March Madness style tournament where people would vote for one against the other. And the one that won eventually is the Tits Out Brigade. So just so you know, that's what I'm going to call you. You can, of course, define yourself however you want, but the Tits Out Brigade. You're welcome. And thank you to the people who helped vote for that. I've actually added stuff to the store, vulgarhistory.store, vulgarhistory.store. There's merch there now that says Tits Out Brigade, if you want everyone to know that you're part of that squad. I've got a cropped hoodie, got a mug, sticker, tote bag, various things. Anyway, that's my little commercial for my own thing. So the members of the Tits Out Brigade who are on Patreon, I gave them a poll of various witches from history. Who do you want me to do an episode about? And they voted for La Voisin, which is who we're going to talk about. Her name is Catherine Mauvoisin, but she was known as La Voisin. And I guess, content warning, this story takes place in France. So I'm going to be using my René Aubergenois as the French chef in Disney's Little Mermaid type accent uncontrollably. So be prepared for that. There's like actual content warnings though, although that that is one because maybe that's annoying to some people. Let's see, in this episode, we're going to be talking about Satanism. We're going to be talking about the murder of babies, infanticide. We're going to be talking about, I guess those are kind of the big ones. We're going to be talking about the Catholic Church. We're going to be talking about, I guess those, those are the biggest ones. Infanticide, Catholic Church, Satanism. It gets pretty dark, this story. So when I put the pull up in the Patreon for for the Patreons to vote on, I honestly was just like, I want to do a Halloween super special. Like, who are some famous witches? And I just kind of found a couple articles that were like, here's some famous real life witches from history. One of them was La Voisin. And I'm like, okay, you know, I sort of scrolled quickly just to see like, is there enough content here to do a little episode? There seemed to be. That's who won. And so then I started researching. And that's why this episode is arriving if everything goes according to plan, one day after I usually plan to. The episodes come out on Wednesdays. I think you're listening to this on a Thursday. It could be a Friday, frankly. Who knows what the future will hold. But the thing is, so La Voisin is a notorious figure in history, and she's part of a larger thing called the Affair of the Poisons. And there's quite a bit written about the affair of the poisons, but not a lot about her. So I ended up doing a bit more digging than I realized I was going to need to do. She has a Wikipedia page. It's not, I'm going to say, super helpful, but it's a good little starting point. And I got definitely some information from there just to get me started. There's an article on sci-fi.com by Jessica Toomer, which is really good in the sense of it makes her the main character and looks at her life and who is she rather than just her as one part of this larger thing. Uh, There was an article on a website called historyofyesterday.com, which I think was written in another language and then translated into English, but I got some facts there I hadn't seen elsewhere. Ultimately, I was just like, this is not enough for me to talk for, you know, 45 minutes about. I need to learn more. And so I went to books. There's two books, both of them out of print. And that's, again why this is coming out a little late because I had to order them from online used bookstores and wait for them to arrive where I live in Saskatoon, which is, I think you get things a lot faster if you live in like London, England or like Toronto. Anyway, it takes a bit longer to get here. Also, there's these supply chain issues. This is not an excuse. This is just explaining the lengths I went to to try and learn about this woman because when I started learning I'm like I want to know more there's so many holes I need filled in so the first book I got is called The Affair of the Poisons Murder, Infanticide, and Satanism at the Court of Louis XIV by Anne Somerset it's a very good book it really goes over the whole Affair of the Poisons and there's quite a bit I won't say quite a bit in there about La Voisin but a good amount but the best book I found the best source full stop about this whole thing. Like I was like, can I even do this podcast? I don't know if I can put this together into a story until I got this other book also out of print. It's called strange revelations, magic poison and sacrilege in Louis XIV's France by Lynn Wood Molenauer and bless you Lynn Wood Molenauer because she really gets into the, the nitty gritty that I wanted to know because again, I'm in Saskatoon, Canada 
Uh, my comprehension of the French language is not great. And I'm really not able to dive in myself to the like first, what's it called? The primary source materials. So I'm really just depending on other people having done a lot of research and written about it. And thank God Lynn Wood Mullenauer did as much as she did. Because I really want to show you this story, but I really couldn't until I had more details to tell you. So there's going to be a lot of place setting because La Voisin was involved in this thing, the affair of the poisons. A lot of people were involved in that. So you really need to understand that to get to like what is her story. But then also because she's like not a super rich woman. And even if she was a super rich woman, we still might not know a lot about her. Her early years, but... Most of the information that we know about her was from, she was, spoiler, arrested for the affair of the poisons when she was in her 40s. And this is kind of what she said about herself, what other people said about her. So just kind of piecing it all together, here's, here's as much of a biography as I have been able to provide. So she was born Catherine de Chey around, she's born around 1640 in Paris, probably. She certainly lived in Paris. Chances are she grew up poor. I mean, she certainly didn't grow up rich. So she clearly developed street smarts, a strong desire to succeed, ambition, um, a sort of ruthlessness. What we're going to see about her, like she clearly had really good um, emotional intelligence. She was really able to manipulate people around her and she find ways to turn what she was doing into various businesses. When she was around 20 years old, she married a man called Antoine Montvoisin, who was a jeweler and a silk merchant. And then she became Catherine Montvoisin, a.k.a. La Voisin. She is, I'm not going to say that as her name the whole time. I'm just going to call her Catherine because otherwise I'm going to annoy even myself. So her husband, Antoine, not a great guy. Uh, not only was he abusive to her and mean, he was also bad at business. He was incompetent and unreliable um, the two of them had several children and they're also supporting, I think her mother and other family members. And so with him not doing a great job, but being a family provider, Catherine was like, well, I'm just going to figure something out and provide for this family myself. So she already had been doing the informal business of fortune telling. So they lived in a house with a sort of little shack in the backyard garden of their home in the sort of Paris suburbs. And so she met with clients there in the sort of little shack in the garden, which offered them privacy. So she would do palm reading, which you probably know about, face reading, which is similar. It's, I don't want to say everyone who does it is a grifter, but I think it's a skill that you, people who are really good at manipulating other people can do very well because you can like watch for the body language or you can even, there wasn't the internet then, but she could learn from like gossip whisper networks who this person is what they're up to so she could tell them kind of what they wanted to hear so she's very skilled at palm reading and face reading um she was able to offer them advice of the sort that kept them coming back for more because she seemed to like really get them she would tell them what they wanted to hear i almost picture it partially maybe as almost like a therapy session like if she just told them like you know what you deserve better in life they'd be like i do you know like who else is telling you that when you're like struggling in Paris in the 17th century. Her fortune telling became so popular, um, word of mouth spread, and she became the one of the go-to fortune tellers for the elite of the French aristocracy. So I also want to say I came to her story thinking like, I want to find a real life witch. And she's not referred to as a witch, really. Well, okay. Spoiler, she is eventually executed for witchcraft, but she's more of a fortune teller slash sorceress slash entrepreneur i would say so where is she living what's the world like so what was happening in the culture at this time and era so first of all everyone was catholic uh, because they had been forced to become catholic do you remember if this is not your first episode of this podcast the whole queen margot situation where it was like the protestants and the catholics and the massacre and like what religion is the country going to have so they had sort settled into like our country france is going to be a catholic country so 
people were familiar with Catholic Mass now because they all had to attend it. But they came to, some of the people would be coming to this Mass with a previous understanding of sort of paganism and those sorts of customs. So when they saw people in church being like, okay, this is the blood of Christ, this is the body of Christ, people would be like, I guess that guy's a magician, and I guess he literally just turned wine into blood. So the line between what is Catholic religion and what is sort of like magic was very thin slash non-existent so people were very into magic they were very into the dark arts um they're also very into poisoning each other so this is an era this is a post catherine de medici era so she had come over from italy and was really knowledgeable about poisons and now lots of other people were too so it was a time where people you couldn't like test if someone had died of poisoning, like the only way you could definitely tell that someone was poisoned was to be like, okay, well, this guy, like he drank from this cup and then he died and there's still some stuff left in the cup. So let's feed that to like a rat. And if the rat dies, then it probably was poison. Like there's, there wasn't really ways to figure out if people were being poisoned. So just a lot of people, poisoning was just like the cool thing people were doing a lot. Versailles was the thing that was happening. The like fancy French court there's that TV show, maybe you watched All the Men with the Nice Hair. So there was a French court at Versailles. So there's all these courtiers who were there. It was really cutthroat because everybody, it was the Sun King, Louis the Fourteenth, right? He was like super important king. And everybody wanted to be his, to be in with him. They wanted to have the king's favor. Uh, women wanted to be the king's mistress. So just to get ahead, people were also poisoning each other a lot there as well, slash doing magic spells to try and do better in court. So it's just sort of like a place where casual use of poison and magic were both happening a lot, especially among more wealthy people. And so when you're someone like Catherine, who's like, well, what if I just expand my business from face and palm reading to also providing poisons and magic spells? So she really saw an opportunity and went for it in a way that reminds me of, go with me here, don't be mad at me, J-Lo, of J-Lo, who was Jennifer Lopez, the first celebrity of kind of the current era to be like famous as an actress and then be like, you know what I'm going to do? Also be like release some albums. You know what I'm also going to do? Jeans and also perfume. Like I feel like J-Lo was the first celebrity ever modern era to come out with a perfume and now everybody halsey selena gomez rihanna like people have their skincare lines they have their makeup like people have clothing lines like just doing lots of different things and that's what Catherine was doing in france she was just like i'm gonna do face reading i'm gonna give people potions to help with their aches and pains i'm gonna give people poison to like kill other people i'm gonna We'll see what she does, but she really, her portfolio was vast. So it's basically when someone came to her wanting something, she, if that wasn't a service she already offered, she'd be like, you know what? Now I do offer that service and I will do that for you. So she actually became so overwhelmed with clients that she started working sort of, so there's sort of like this magical underground of people doing stuff like this. There was midwives, oh, abortion. Did I say that? That's another trigger warning abortions abortionists um there was renegade priests there was just kind of a lot of there was this whole black market of like people doing magic related stuff around paris and so she they really referred people to each other a lot um so it's not like she set up franchises or satellite locations but she really would sort of get other people to help her out because she was just one person and she could only do so much so the client's who were able to pay for this were super rich aristocrats. Poor people would do things too, but just they could afford less stuff. Like maybe you could get a potion. You wouldn't be able to get a magic spell that a priest said at a mass, you know? So it's just kind of like a sliding scale sort of thing. But also Catherine and other people like her seem to have used this sort of like literally a sliding scale. So the very wealthy people, they would charge so much money to them because those people could pay it. Kind of. They were all sort of wildly in debt, but technically they could pay it. 
And that way they were able to, Catherine was able to provide services to people who didn't have as much money. So it all kind of balanced out in this kind of cool way. But remember, country, France, super Catholic at the time. So although this was all happening and like everyone was doing it, everyone had to pretend like it wasn't happening and they weren't doing it. So in 1665 or 1666, when she would have been in her 20s, she was questioned by some people, some Catholic type authorities who were just like, "Mm, are you doing magic and things? But she explained towards the professors at the Sorbonne University. Again, I don't know the details of this because there's not a lot of written about her. But her defense is basically all of her powers were given to her by God. So actually, she's being like a really especially good Catholic by doing what God wants her to do, which is tell fortunes and sell potions. And they were like, that's a great point. So go ahead and do it. They likely also gave her a pass for what she's doing because she was friendly with lots of super important people. Um, One might assume she may have also been blackmailing people, like there was priests she was dealing with, and maybe the priest didn't want her to out them. So, yeah, So she, but she, like in her testimony and stuff when she's arrested later, it's all really wrapped up together in this fascinating way, the whole being a Catholic, but also doing magic and... Uh, all in one sort of thing to her is how she saw it. Maybe that's how she portrayed herself as seeing it. So she just kept expanding her business where she saw opportunities. Um, As I mentioned, there was overlap between people wanting magic potions and people who need midwife care and people seeking abortions because a lot of her business was women. And so women who, for whatever reason, you know, if they wanted a man to fall in love with them, if they wanted their husband to die if they wanted to have a baby if they wanted to not have a baby like there's overlap right like there's a potion but also maybe like a midwife could help you with these things so Catherine from what I can tell she didn't herself like she didn't perform abortions herself but she would refer them to one of her colleagues people like a woman called Catherine Bello known as La La Pair and her daughter everybody's got a cool name in this like Love it. So, um, abortionists were known as angel makers due to how they offered women of all classes a means of escaping the relentless cycle of pregnancy and childbirth. So, abortionists were usually midwives as well. Their methods included herbs that would cause abortions. Uh, They would also perform surgical procedures or simply took away an unwanted infant after delivery. Allegedly, Some of these angel makers hid the evidence of their work by bringing it to Catherine to destroy. Now, this is, no one knows this for sure. Catherine liked to brag and to self-promote like any good entrepreneur. So also when she was drinking, she just like got the loose lips. Like she would just say a little bit too much. And so allegedly she bragged that she had burned the bodies of 2,500 infants in the little stove in her garden consulting room, which is a huge number even considering she's doing this for like 20 years that's like elizabeth bathory level really huge number so i think she said that to try and someone said she said that a person who was arrested and who's trying to make Catherine look bad was like oh but Catherine once said that she burned 2500 infants in her stove so this is where a lot of this there's a i'm dubious about some of the facts, especially kind of the most dramatic ones. Like, at first, I'm like, is this an Elizabeth Bathory thing? Like, did she actually do anything? Because a lot of the claims are so wild, like 2,500 infants. But Catherine did do a lot of stuff. We just don't know if she did that. What we do know is that several of her potions, the love potions or potions for people who want babies or whatever, um, did require as some of their ingredients they needed things that emerged in the childbirth experience like the afterbirth so i think she might have had some sort of arrangement with some of the midwives slash abortionists to get i don't know not like stem cells but what's it called the umbilical cord and things so all of this keep in mind is happening but abortion was a capital offense at the time So if someone was found to have had an abortion, both the mother of the aborted child and the midwife who performed the abortion were both liable to be sentenced to the death penalty. 
So this was also like a thing a lot of people did, but uh, you didn't want to brag about it. Although apparently Catherine did like to brag about it. So um, let's see. So some of the other things that Catherine and other sorceresses slash entrepreneurs like her, they provided remedies, not just for like love potions, not just midwife referrals, but they also provided remedies to cure headaches, leprosy, pimples, bad breath, labor pains. Um, She also sold cosmetics, um, products to whiten the complexion, uh, powders to whiten the teeth and dyes to cover the gray in your hair. So she was just like a one woman Sephora slash, I don't know, like new age essential oil center. She would sell people a substance called potable gold, which was believed to cure almost any malady. So when she was arrested, they seized a grimoire from her book, like literally a grimoire, which if you don't know, is like recipe book for witchcraft. Um, And so there were ingredients like for all of her potions listed in there. And so the recipe that she has for potable gold is basically identical to ones found in documents from the middle ages so she wasn't just making this stuff up like she found what the spells ingredients were and then she did them herself um according to her notes in her grimoire uh potable gold could relieve lethargy pleurisy ulcers gangrene and rabies among numerous other afflictions so she dispensed this at great expense to her wealthiest clients so again she was charging the most money to the people who could afford it So yeah, so she provided amulets and charms, but even the most innocuous of these, like, you know, just like a little, a little pendant would technically violate the Catholic church's prohibition against superstition, which is a wild thing to prohibit. Like you just can't be superstitious. Like to tell someone you can't be superstitious, it doesn't stop someone from, you know, when someone sneezes from saying, God bless you. Like it's so, and this is a period where people just really believed literally in magic. Um, there's a lot of wars going on. So there were some men clients of hers. They wanted her to cast a spell that rendered its user invulnerable to sword wounds, according to Catherine's grimoire. Okay, this is an interesting one because it's not like, you know, get an afterbirth and mix it with potable gold. It's like, it's basically just a mantra. So the spell, quote unquote, is just every day. So three times every let me see. Every morning, three times while still in bed and three times after getting out of the bed, you just kind of said this phrase, which is, I arise in the name of Jesus Christ. Please govern me well and guide me to eternal life in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's literally just a prayer slash mantra slash just, you know, positive self-talk like that. So people would pay her and she would tell them that like, amazing. So this doesn't seem specifically you know, satanic. It literally is a prayer. But this was written in her grimoire. Like, here's how you make people not die in combat. And she wrote it in her grimoire. So it just kind of shows, again, that sort of like mixed up or just blended gray area between what is religion and what is magic. And how did she interpret that? So let's see. She also sold items that promised to make their clients wealthy because people were ambitious. Um, So there were some charms or spells to make people you know do well at playing cards or other sorts of gambling let's see oh okay so there's a thing some babies are born with a thing called a call c-a-u-l so like literally when a baby is born some babies have a piece of membrane covering the newborn's head and face uh this is rare occurring in fewer than one in eighty thousand births the call is harmless and immediately removed like this still happens this happened back then but It was believed back then that anyone who was born with a call meant that that was a lucky person. And then they sort of extended that to be like, so if anyone owned a call, even if it wasn't the one they were born with, then that would make them lucky too. So again, she would work alongside the midwives and the abortionists and get people calls or, you know what, I'm going to guess other things that they just kind of claimed were calls because who's going to know really So there's two things that were like, if someone was in serious financial trouble slash, but still able to pay for Catherine to help them out, there's two things that they could get. There was a magic coin called the pistole volant, 
which was a, allegedly a magical coin that could be spent repeatedly. No matter how many times the owner exchanged the coin, it would always reappear in his or her pocket. How did Catherine do that? I don't know. Um, but for it's, it's a two part thing. So you get the magic coin, but then to make it work, especially good, you wanted to combine it with a thing called a man de glore, which I think is the hand of glory. Oh my God. So a man de glore, mega expensive. Catherine, who also kept very careful record keeping of how much money she made doing different things. She once sold one for 50 gold coins and an amethyst ring. So a man de glore, I'm not going to, it's a really, basically by the time you give it to a person, I th she's basically giving them a box, but the backstory for what she would say had happened to it before. You get a, a mare in heat and you strip the hide hair and everything off of it while saying a specific chant. Then you conceal the skin in a safe place. Then you set off and purchase a new earthenware pot without bargaining over its price. These are all the instructions. Upon returning from getting your earthenware pot, you fill the pot with water from a fountain, submerge the hair, the mare hide in it. I wrote mare, but I think it's hair. I think I did a typo there because a mare, that's like a horse, right? So anyway, cover the pot, place the pot with the hide in it somewhere no one could see it after nine days, open the pot and there will be a serpent inside of it. Okay. Um, the skin of the hair and heat has turned into a serpent and then you are to tell the serpent I accept this pact then you put the serpent inside a new box with gold coins and then you're supposed to sleep with the serpent box next to you for three to four hours and you're anyway this is wild but basically you just be like here's a box trust me I did all this stuff to it please pay me 50 gold coins and amethyst ring and people would because she was good at convincing them that her stuff worked and those are kind of like the things that some men would be looking for. But she, most of her clients seem to have been women. And the women also had a desire for power. But for them, that was procured through love and or sex. And or both. A lot of this had to do with an advantageous marriage. So men, for instance, like, and I'm talking like men and women because this is a very gender binary type world that everyone is living in here where it's like marriage is between a man and a woman and um because the marriages were financial things that were all about like conceiving children so men in general um would use love magic to find financially advantageous marriages so like get rich quick sort of spell so it's about money even though it, the love magic would be to make a woman a wealthy woman fall in love with you oh no sorry because it's not just between the man and the woman to get married. Relatives had to consent to the marriages, especially if you're a rich young woman. So the spells men would ask for would be ones that focus on the relatives of the woman who they want to marry to manipulate them into consenting that he could marry this person. Women, in general, um, would come to her for spells to provide financial security. So... Catherine provided things like a powder, a powdered herb that would inspire a man to fall in love with you if he came in contact with the powder. Um, one client, Catherine, advised to put the powder in a drawer through which the man was likely to search because then he would come into contact with it. She also had a substance you could rub into your own hands and then you'd touch the man with your hands with the stuff on it and that would make him fall in love with you. Um, powdered pigeon hearts were also often used for love spells. Those would be maybe slipped into the food of the man you wanted to fall in love with you. And then you could also, we're going to get into the renegade priests in detail, but you could also, Catherine could arrange for people to get a renegade priest to say a special series of prayers at various churches. Because again, the line between like magic and priests and being a Catholic were very blurred. Um... What's interesting, um, at least one of Catherine's clients was in love with a man, but it's not just like, oh, I want to be with this man. It's like this woman was a widow. She had five young children and needed a husband for financial support. So she just like set her sights on this guy and like was going after it. Now, there's all these herbs, spells and things going on. So what I think it's like if you really set your heart on something and just like really, isn't that the secret? 
by Rhonda Byrne to just like manifest things. So maybe that was happening a bit too. So she's a picture of women who wanted to make a man fall in love with them, as well as women who wanted to try to make an abusive spouse kinder, which is so heartbreaking where it's like women were so powerless it's like well i'm in this horrible marriage to this abusive man but like instead of being like so can you help me kill him it's like can you just make him be nicer to me it's heartbreaking so as per this book i read by lynn wood mullenauer women's use of love magic during this era undermined the social and spiritual order love magic is if successful was intended to bind another's will influence over a man's emotions threatened to become command over his reason which would consequently allow an unruly woman to overturn the natural patriarchal order. So women going to Catherine to get these spells was like challenging to all of society. Uh, Some of the situations where it's complicated. So one of her clients also wanted uh, some potions to make her husband love her better, but that wasn't because she wanted the husband to be nicer to her. It's because she wanted to have lovers But she thought if the husband loved her, then he would let her have lovers. So Catherine was just like seeing it all. People were just coming to her and just talking to her like a bartender slash life coach. And she would just be like, wow, what a serious problem. Can you just like pay me, you know, $59.99 for this potion that will fix it all for you? Great. Uh, There's also, of course, lovers who sought themselves to rid, to get rid of rivals or spouses who stood in the way of them being together. So love magic was often well i don't know if you can say often sometimes used also for murder reasons in fact uh catherine herself remember her husband who was like not great bad at business um mean to her etc she had in fact on more than one occasion tried to kill her husband but had not been successful so it was widely known that she didn't care much for antoine she herself had numerous lovers including magicians alchemists an executioner a tavern keeper um a member of the aristocracy who she'd met when she was like giving him palm reading lessons like she clearly she had admirers and they were all knew that her husband is terrible so one of her lovers actually recalled that the standard form of greeting her was just to be like is your husband dead yet was like how you said bonjour because it was just so widely known that she hated her husband But the thing is, Antoine, her husband, was friends with a public executioner, and he knew what she was up to. And he said if he died, he'd already left instructions to have an autopsy done in his body. So if he was murdered, then she would be arrested for murdering him. So it's this like stalemate, horrible marriage situation. The reason why she would try to kill her husband, why so many other women might want to do that, is again, it's a powerlessness thing. Like getting a divorce was basically impossible in this in 17th century Catholic France. Like, basically, it was so hard to get a divorce. Like, so many people had to okay it who would never okay it. Like, killing your husband just seemed, like, easier. So, and this was because the marriages were, again, were arranged by these powerful families for reasons where they wanted the alliance between the two families. So they would never want the marriage to end because it's, like, a business decision. For an aristocrat to marry for love would undermine everything about just the way the society was functioning. Again, this is from Lynn Wood Mullenauer's book. So, love magic, sold by Catherine, promised women the opportunity to defy patriarchal authority by ridding themselves of their husbands and marrying lovers of their own choosing. The use of magic proved highly subversive of the social order as well as on religious orthodoxy by undermining the limits imposed on women's behavior and thus threatened the institution of the family, the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and by extension, the state itself. By helping women try to achieve control over men's passions through charms, potions, and rituals, Catherine was corrupting the social order. So it's not just like, we're Catholic, so we don't like witches. It's like, she was... Everything she was doing would upend just the way that the patriarchal society was understood to function. So if somebody tried like a potion, a hand cream, pigeon hearts, like, and it still wasn't working, the person still hadn't fallen in love with them, like the next most extreme thing you could do is to have Catherine arrange for you a sacrilegious ritual. And this required the assistance of an ordained priest. So like a 
literal priest, not just a guy in a robe. Like you need an actual priest because priests are considered to be among the most powerful magicians of all because of what I said, like how at church they would sort of be like, now the, the bread and the wine turns into the body and blood. So everyone's like, great priests clearly like have a connection between like our world and like the underworld. Like, so they are magicians. So priests are considered to be the most powerful magicians of all. And so if they did a spell or a ritual, then the spell or ritual would have extra power because they were the one doing it, which would make it more likely to work, whatever you're trying to make the ritual achieve, making someone love you or whatever. In fact, the priests were at the center of the criminal magical underworld of Paris because... Their activities place them at the center of this informal network, linking practitioners of almost every sort of nefarious activity in the city. So they not only acted as sorceresses, suppliers, and assistants, but functioned as magicians and necromancers in their own right, too. This is priests. So when I say supplies, like they could supply, say Catherine needed holy water for a ritual or something, or if she needed, like, the priest needed to, like, bless the pigeon hearts or whatever. Like, she needed their assistance so also just fyi these renegade priests were fully dirtbags like they were awful people like even though they were doing similar stuff to Catherine in the sense of like potentially ripping people off and grifting them they had a lot more political and institutional power as men and being involved with the catholic church so they weren't they were at risk obviously like if the like catholic authorities found out the priests were doing this they would be in trouble but they didn't have to be doing this. Like they were doing okay themselves being wealthy priests where Catherine kind of, if she didn't do this, like she would have no money. So like Catherine and her colleagues were people like poor people doing the best they could. The renegade priests were just like already kind of wealthy people who just like got a side hustle because they could. So they were normal priests by day admired by the community and presenting themselves as being like, you know, holy, etc. by night They not only were, like, running around doing, like, secret evil masses and, like, you know, blessing calls, but they also had mistresses and secret babies. And then at least this one guy, it said, like, his, he maybe, like, sacrificed, like, he had babies with his mistresses. And then he would, like, when the baby was born, he would, like, use the baby as a human sacrifice for, like, an evil ritual and stuff. And I was being like, oh, did Catherine do that? And I don't know. But did the priest do that? that? This one guy did. For sure. So they're all just like lecherous, breaking all their priestly vows. So they were just kind of awful and very powerful. And what they did, part of what they did as well, the renegade priests, was sort of like privatized church services. So like someone could go to church and like see a priest, like do confession or whatever. Um, but these priests would be like, do you want to have like an on-demand special mass just for you? Like, okay, pay me and then I'll do that. Or they could also do things within the church. So for instance, in this era and time, in order to be allowed to take communion at Easter mass, so like the little flat bread thing that Catholics have, you had to first confess your sins to be eligible to like get one of those. But one client of, I think of Catherine's, or maybe just of one of the priests I was reading about, She didn't want to confess her sins because they were so bad. She didn't want anyone to know about them. So she paid a priest to make a special communion wafer just for her. So she could go up for communion. And it looks like she was getting communion like everybody else. But really, it was like a special not um, blessed communion host. So it looked like she was a good person. But really, she just paid him to do that for her. Um... The priests would also bless the calls and afterbirths and other ingredients for the love potions that Catherine would prepare for wealthy women. So, necromancy, which I had thought meant things with dead people, but in this era and place, necromancy meant magic to summon evil demons and get them to do your bidding. So not bringing dead bodies to life, but summoning evil demons, getting them to do your bidding. And... The majority of necromancers in this time and place were also priests and they would, the culmination of like their necromancy, like summoning forth demons to do your bidding was a thing called the amatory mass. An amatory mass is a 
Catholic style mass. So a Catholic mass, which you might have seen in Midnight Mass on Netflix or in The Exorcist or in your life at some point. Usually there's an altar, which is sort of like a long table and then the priest lays all the stuff on the table it's like here's the goblet of the wine here's the hosts um he lays up various things on the, the altar for an amatory mass um being done by an ordained priest to summon a demon to do your bidding uh you would instead of having an altar you would have a naked lady being your altar so i don't know if she would be lying on the altar itself or just like lying on the ground and you sort of like crouch around her so also i just want to also note that this is not the same thing as i think i called it a black mass before but this is an amatory mass so a black mass which this is not is a form of satan worship an amatory mass being done by Catherine's priest colleagues were being done as a sort of intersection between demon summoning and love magic and they were paid for and done for women who were really intent on making a man fall in love with them or fall back in love with them. Yeah, so similar to a Catholic mass, but with a naked woman as your altar, often the woman who wanted the man to fall in love with her would herself be the altar. So I guess the demon, I don't know. A naked woman, either the person who paid for it or a stand-in. Um, another difference from a regular Catholic mass was you need to have candles made from the fat of a hanged man, which is very specific. Um, and you also maybe needed a baby. So remember when I said trigger warning, infanticide, that's this part. The thing about infanticide is that once Catherine is arrested, again, spoiler, that's how we know all of this from various people being questioned. So this is one of the main crimes that she's charged with eventually, and she always denied having done this, even though in public, apparently, she would brag about having buried or burned so many babies. Here's the thing. So this was one of the reasons why I really wanted to dive into this story, more so than just like skimming a few articles. Baby murder. It's such a thing. So it's such a thing that people accuse their enemies of doing, but like, because I think it gets this visceral response from people being like, oh my God, that person, like they're killing babies. Like, well, that must mean they're evil. So I will villainize them also. So there's a long history um, of people being accused of killing babies, including ancient Christians were accused of it. Um, Jewish people in the medieval times, witches in the Renaissance era, um, daycare operators in the 1980s during the satanic panic. Lots of people lately with Pizzagate and QAnon. It's sort of like a go-to thing. So just when I hear like someone is killing babies, not that that could never happen, but it just makes me think like, Ugh, is this just someone trying to villainize them in sort of like a really gross but also easy way? So we do not know for sure if living babies were literally killed at these amatory masses held by Catherine's friends. Given that Catherine had inns with midwives and abortionists, uh, it's possible that maybe a stillborn baby or a baby who was born early and didn't survive, um, or maybe like a fetus might have been used in place of like actually slitting the throat of a living baby. There were some, some of the priests, some of the renegade priests did later confess to doing all of this, but it's sort of like in the Salem witch trials situation, which I assume we all know about, where like, if you're tortured enough, like people will say anything really. So it's like, is this true? So to quote Anne Somerset from my source, The Affair of the Poisons, that book, it is impossible to know whether children had really been sacrificed in black magic ceremonies in Paris. Obviously, at a time when poverty and lack of contraception ensured there were many unwanted babies, finding infant victims would not have presented an insurmountable problem, and one cannot rule out that such horrors took place. One must, however, be wary of being too credulous. History abounds with cases where witches have confessed to participating in atrocities and abominations which we know to be fictitious. This is continuing on, quoting Anne Somerset. 
A recent, recent authority has suggested that under relentless interrogation, which is engaged in a peculiar kind of dialogue with their interlocutors, adapting their responses to meet expectations, and it is now recognized that under extreme stress, individuals will mingle themes from their cultural milieu with elements derived from dream and fantasy to generate self-incriminating narratives, which have their own psychological significance. So... I'm just going to like set the whole like infanticide thing aside because it's just like we don't know for sure. And it's such a horrible major thing to accuse somebody of doing. So it's like it is possible this happened, but also we don't know that for sure. And I don't want to dwell on it. So basically what we do know is that these renegade priests, um, sometimes Catherine would hire them to do this. They would do these amatory masses. So naked lady lying there who had paid for this mass to be said the priest would say various things do various things um to allegedly summon the demon power and at the end of some of the masses the priest would then make love to the woman which and so Catherine, just with his diverse portfolio of products and services cosmetics poisons arranging murders amatory masses um, grimoire, referring people to abortionists. She was never short on business. She was flourishing. According to one account, before she got up every morning, there were folk waiting to see her, and throughout the rest of the day, she was with more people. After that, she kept open house in the evening with a violin playing and was always making merry. Which, this is also, again, the thing. She liked to drink, and when she drank, she liked to say more than maybe she should be saying so she just entertained people in her garden in the evening like she was just like living her life if i might say tits out speaking of so one of catherine's long time and eventually most important and clients and also an incredibly important person in the whole the affair of the poisons was a woman named Françoise Athanaïs de Rochechouart de Montemart, Marquise of Montespan, a.k.a. Madame Montespan, who was the mistress of the king for 12 years, from 1667 to 1679. And we need to kind of explain her rise to power and what that has to do with Catherine to understand what happens next. So, well, I'll, first I'll tell you that the king, Louis XIV, was married to Maria Theresa of Spain. And Maria Theresa of Spain had just kind of pieced out entirely of court life. She was not into it. She's doing her own thing. I didn't read up on her very much, but I assume she was a cool person. And so Louis was just living it up with his various mistresses, just like living that Versailles life. Whoever his main mistress was, because he had like, it's like sister wives. So There's like mistress number one, mistress number two. So it's like, who's the most powerful? And whoever the number one most powerful mistress was, was effectively the shadow queen. She did all the queen things because the queen was not there. It had wild amounts of power. And that's why a lot of women, like this woman, turned to magic to try and get that job. So the person we're talking about, she was born Francoise. She was born October 1640, which is the same year as when Catherine was born same age so she was born Francoise but then in a very Claire Claremont proto Claire Claremont type moment she changed her name to Atanaïs which frankly and this is not just because you know Claire Claremont is my girl and as a person growing up named Anne like the most boring name in existence Anne like not even Anne with an E just A-N-N I always wanted to change my name to something cool and my parents would not let me change my name to something cool and I've come around and I'm okay with my name but if I was growing up and my name was Francoise and I could become a Tanais like of course I would do that so she just rebranded herself she became a Tanais um, her family was very well connected. She was very rich. She was married when she was 23 years old. She married Louis Henri de Pardéan de Gondren, the Marquis of Montespan, who was about her same age, although she was in love with another man because her life is 
real scandalous. We're not going to be scoring her, but I think if we did, she'd get high marks. So they had two children together, her and her husband, and she got a job as the a lady in waiting to the Duchess of Orleans at royal court. So that got her on the scene, and she became known as the reigning beauty of the court. And she was very beautiful. Everybody said so. When you look at portraits of her, of Atanais, you see that she... Honestly, I'm just like, did everybody back then have the same face? Or were the painters just only capable of drawing one face? Because she looks just kind of a lot like everybody else from the same time. But I think it's probably a Cleopatra thing where it's like, when you saw her in person, like the power of her charisma would just make her the most beautiful person in the room. She was also very cultured. She was a good conversationalist. She kept on top of political news and events. And this made her even more appealing to men of intellect and power because she could keep up with them in conversations. She was courted by a number of suitors, but had her sights set on the king. Because this is a situation where, like, like the debauchery. Like, I really hope I'm setting the scene of just... The country was ostensibly a Catholic country where you're supposed to, like, follow all the Bible rules. But in Versailles, anything goes. And then in, like, the magical underworld of Paris, anything goes. Like, people were just secretly living life tits out while pretending to be tits in sort of moment. And so Montespan, we'll just call her that. So she first visited Catherine Montvoisin in 1665 for love magic to help her win the heart of the king. And so this is when she was like, they were both like 25 years old. Yeah, so they're both 25 years old. So even by age 25, Catherine was already like the go-to for ambitious young aristocrats. Now, I'm not sure if this becomes a whole thing, and I won't get into it because I honestly can't keep track of it, but Madame de Montespan didn't necessarily go to Catherine herself, but she sent like her lady-in-waiting, like she sent her companion to go and do these errands and like pick up, you know, the potions and whatever, but they seem to have had some sort of business relationship. So allegedly, Catherine and Madame de Montespan, well, Madame de Montespan got Catherine to call on the devil and pray to him for the king's love. So she provided Madame de Montespan with a potion that she would use for the duration of her relationship with the king. So, because, spoiler, the king fell in love with her. So she... Once she was in with the king, she, like, Catherine, like a subscription service. Like, Catherine would just keep her with this potion to keep putting in the king's food to, like, keep the king staying in love with her. Was the potion doing anything, or was the king just actually in love with her? You know, who's to say? Again, it's The Secret by Rhonda Byrne manifesting. So Madame de Montespan. So she was rich enough to get all all the things. I'm sure she got the powders. She got the hand cream. She got the... Amatory masses. She she did literally everything she could because she wanted to be the king's mistress, and she was also beautiful and smart, and got the king's attention through all of this stuff. And she became the king's new mistress, even though the mistress before her, Louise de la Valliere, was literally pregnant with his child. And the king left Louise to be with Madame de Montespan. Who? Side note. I feel like, do you need love magic when you do things like this? Which is apparently, she is said to have seduced the king by dropping her towel when she was getting out of the shower and he was walking by. Like, I don't know if she needed magic, but if it gave her a little bit more confidence, good for her. So the king was not strictly monogamous to her because that's not the deal, but she was the main mistress. So again, for like 12 years, she was effectively the shadow queen, like the most powerful woman around. But when she felt threatened, like another mistress was maybe getting too powerful, she would send her maid to see Catherine again to arrange more amatory masses, which she felt like were helpful. So she did this in 1676. So that's like 10 years in on her relationship with the king. She also had like seven children with the king. And because of how France worked, the children were all legitimized. So they weren't like considered illegitimate children. So, which is notable for later. Anyway, so 1676, she turned to Catherine again and it worked. The other person um, did not win the king's heart. And then three years later, 1679, she turned to Catherine again, but this time she was unsuccessful, sort of. 
So the king had moved on to a new hot young mistress named the Duchess of Fontange, who actually died before she could officially become his mistress. And this is a thing where it's like, did Madame de Montespan poison her with the help of Catherine? Like, to me, it sounds like pretty possible. Because again, like everyone's just poisoning everyone all the time. It's just this, that's just what you do. Which brings us to the affair of the poisons, which is, which is the thing. So a woman named Madame de Brun, Brunvilliers, Brunvilliers in 1676, she was accused and went to trial for having conspired with her lover to poison her father and two of her brothers for inheritance reasons. And she was in fact herself an accomplished poisoner. She had practiced and honed her poisoning skills by being sort of like a candy striper of evil in a hospital where a lot of people died so like she tried different poisons on the different patients and be like oh no all the patients keep dying and then like note to self that poison works well she was tortured and confessed and was sentenced to death she was beheaded and her body was burned at the stake so like r.i.p madame de brinvilliers this sensational trial like this trial caused a sensation because it's got everything and this kind of brought the king's attention and other people's attention to the fact that like haven't there been other mysterious deaths that all have to maybe also to do with like inheritances or like people keep dying could everyone be poisoning each other so then the king himself started to worry that he might be poisoned so he got well first of all a taste tester if he didn't already and then he got he hired a guy to start investigating what's going on with all these poisonings. You know, where's the poison coming from? Is there potentially a secret underground magical community in the catacombs of Paris? And this brought to light, yes, there is. <laughs> and Catherine is like the main character of that. Basically what happened is uh, just people were brought in and to save themselves, the people would blab on other people. You know, one sorceress was brought in and that sorceress was like, uh, no, I didn't do anything. It was this person. And that person's like, it was me. It was this person. And so eventually there was somebody named Marie Boss. So Marie Boss was a former colleague of Catherine's, but they had, they'd worked together to help this client murder a man because this woman wanted to murder her husband so she could marry someone else. So they had like teamed up to just like co-poison this man, but then they had a falling out when Catherine felt Marie hadn't paid her as much as she'd promised to like help out with this poison situation, Marie still mad at Catherine would like squeal on her. So then Catherine herself was arrested as she left her parish parish church after Sunday mass. So she was now, and so is Madame de Montespan, uh, 42 years old. Catherine was so successful from her many enterprises her many businesses that she was said to fling handfuls of coins from her carriage as she drove around the city baller move and so the thing with Catherine, as i mentioned before when she was drunk she was known to just like get a bit too chatty chatty so when she was first arrested they didn't even torture her they just like kept her constantly drunk to get her talking and in fact she did so she revealed the names of several important courtiers who were her clients which was a main domino in the whole affair of the poisons thing happening because the king was like find out who's doing the poisonings and it turns out it's like guess who's doing the poisonings like all of your friends and your mistress and the king was like that's not what i wanted you to find out so but she denied having anything to do with madame de montespan or even with madame de montespan's maid but the names of the aristocrats she did mention and maybe she mentioned their names hoping that her connection to them would like help save her or something it, it was so problematic that the king just kind of sealed all the records to be like, let's just not let anyone know that literally everyone I know is involved in sorcery and poisonings. Oh, and that, so it was this. So when she was arrested, the renegade priests were also arrested. Um, her ex-lover was arrested, who was a magician. And he was the one, it was at this point, he claimed that she had the remains of 2,500 aborted infants in her garden which he was just trying to make her look bad. Like everyone was just trying to make everyone else look bad so that they themselves would not be executed. Catherine denied having 2,500 aborted infants in her garden and the garden was never searched. So either the king didn't want to investigate this abortions angle or just everyone was like, that's too big a number. We're just going to assume you're lying. There's even one point where Catherine 
and her rival Marie were like brought into a room together, I guess, to try and see if they could make each other talk. And it was this classic, like, I'm going to say like dynasty slash days of our lives slash moment where just these two women who hated each other, but were so cool. were just, were like, well, you did this. And then the other one's like, no, I didn't. And you did this. And they were just like, flinging accusations at each other while the king's investigator just like wrote it all down being like oh wow look at all these things that are true where it's like are these things true or are these women just trying to like tell each other off and sort of no what it is is it's like a reading it's like a rupaul's drag race moment basically so like that's the sort of context in which some of the stuff about catherine is found where they're just not even torturing people but just like everyone was desperately saying horrible things about other people so that they themselves would seem less bad so yeah Catherine was put on trial she was found guilty and was sentenced to be burnt alive for witchcraft and poisoning under quest she was questioned again so even after she had been sentenced to be executed she was tortured again because they're like can we get anything else out of her which i feel like at this point they should be like let's make her stop talking because this is everything she says just makes more important people be in trouble so even under torture she continued to deny having anything to do with madame de montespan or her maid and to not know anything about priests conducting amatory masses even though she was already going to be executed prior to her execution she was taken for one final confession at which she because she just like is a showman show woman above anything else one less final twist she at her confession, she requested to retract one of her allegations, and everyone was just like, what a twist! Um, but I don't think they let her do that. So, her execution. She is dressed in white, because that is what people wore when they were being executed. Apparently, the descriptions I read just said she's wearing a white gown, and her face was very red. And I, you know what, I have a pale complexion. When I'm feeling heightened emotions, my face gets red too. Understandable to me. Also, she'd just been tortured, so red face. She was taken to the scaffold on, I guess, some sort of, like, cart or something. The streets of Paris filled with people wishing to catch a glimpse of her because she was so famous. Like, I think she'd been famous as a business person before, like, people recommending each other to see her, but now she'd been arrested. I'm sure there was, you know, lots of pamphlets and things about her, so she was super famous. Everybody wanted to see her passing by. Um, When they got to the place where she was being executed, she refused to get out of the cart. So would I. Understandable. She had to be dragged out by force. Apparently, she was swearing dreadful oaths as they did that. Good for her again. Then she was chained to the stake upon which she was going to be burned, but she was still desperate to save herself, which, you know, there's been other stories about people being executed who are so, like, poised and graceful and, like, you know, willing to do it, but she was just like, fuck, no. I don't want to be, I don't want to die. So they started like heaping straw around her so that she would like burn more easily. And she like kicked the straw away. Like she was not going down without a fight. Catherine Mulvoisin, legend. She was burned at the stake and died on February 22nd, 1680. One month before her execution, Catherine, so remember she had children. So she had a daughter named Marie Marguerite, who was her oldest daughter. And I guess she sort of... She had been her assistant against her will. Marie Marguerite didn't want to do this, but I guess Catherine treated her pretty poorly. Marie Marguerite was arrested and brought in for questioning before Catherine was executed. She didn't say anything, but then after her mother was executed, Marie Marguerite was like, well, you know, she maybe wanted to, like, help her mother by not talking, but then her mother was executed, so she's like, might as well tell them what I'm here to say. I don't think she was tortured. I think she just, like, offered up information, like, as a witness. So she said she hadn't um, wanted to help her mother, but her mother had said she would like poison her if she didn't, which so just abused her to make her help out with various things. But Marie Marguerite didn't know exactly what was going on. Like she would just see bits and pieces of things or maybe she'd help, you know, like sun dry the pigeon hearts or whatever. So she didn't, she was not like, Catherine was not her mentor. She didn't like show her the grimoire and teach her the spells. Marie Marguerite was just sort of like helping out in an assistant capacity but it's from marie marguerite that we learn that catherine probably did have dealings with madame de montespan's maid um 
it was also Marie Marguerite. So I don't know if this was just like her wanting to tell a good story or if this is true, but she said that Madame de Montespan had in fact poisoned that, her rival, remember the other mistress who died. Marie Marguerite also alleged that Madame de Montespan had wanted Catherine to help with a plot to poison the king himself. Kinda. So she explained that before Catherine was arrested, Catherine had tried to present a petition to the king. And the questioners were really like, why did she want to present a petition to the king? Like, what was in that? So I guess it's a thing where like, you know, the king sits at a table and people can come in and be like, I want more sheep or whatever. So she wanted to see the king. And they were like, was it because she wanted to poison the king? Was there poison on the letter? And even Marie Marguerite was like, that's not how poison works. You can't like put poison on paper but they were like okay marie marguerite said that catherine wanted to poison the king this is a case of regicide and they just kind of got carried away with it but eventually like from what marie marguerite said the involvement of madame de montespan even at an arm's length in like any of this was just more than the king had wanted to know especially because remember madame de montespan had like seven children with him and they had been legitimized. Oh no, she was the mother of three of his legitimized children. And so this would threaten those children and it kind of makes the king look dumb if his mistress is like doing all this stuff. So the king was just like, let's just stop this investigation and pretend like it never happened. All told, the affair of the poisons implicated 442 suspects of whom 218 were arrested. Of these, 36, including Catherine, were executed and 23 were sent to exile. Many of the accused were never brought to trial, but because they were too important or something, but they were placed outside the justice system and imprisoned for life, like on the down low. The whole thing ended in 1682 when the king abolished the whole situation because it was becoming obvious literally everyone important was involved in all of this and it might taint his own reputation. Understandably, from all this, Madame de Montespan fell out of royal favor. She was no longer a number one mistress, and she retired herself to a convent. She had a lengthy retirement period in the convent. I hope she had a nice time. She donated lots of money to hospitals and charities. She was a generous patron of the arts and the letters. Uh, she also gave, devoted the, these final years of her life to a very severe penance, maybe for having, I don't know. I guess, for, like, poisoning people, allegedly. Her three youngest children were very sad about her death, but the king forbade them to wear mourning for her because he wanted to just, like, pretend she never existed. She died May 27, 1707, aged 66. And actually, she died while taking the waters, so, like, you know, bathing herself at a place where there's supposed to be um, healing waters to try and heal an illness. So, you know what? She's still into, like, I'm going to say superstition-based medicine. Catherine's daughter, Marie Marguerite, along with five other associates of Catherine's. So even though they were not, I don't think, charged with anything, they were just for being involved generally. They were imprisoned at a women's prison and Marie Marguerite's date of death is unknown and that is the saga of Catherine Mauvoisin aka La Voisin and the affair of the poisons so for a minute it seemed like I was going to have to like score the affair of the poisons and not her until I found that second book that had so much good information and so now I feel comfortable scoring so we turn now to the Fredegund Memorial Scandalicious Scale Catherine so, scandaliciousness, I think, is inarguably a 10 based on all of it. Like, even even though not everything that she was accused of necessarily happened, the fact that she was accused of it is scandaliciousness. She was involved in the affair of the poisons, like a literal scandal. She liked to brag about doing all this wild stuff, even if she didn't do it, which is just... Like, this scandaliciousness is very high. Like, that's, that's just a 10. I don't think it could be anything less. Her scheminess, I think, is also quite high because scheminess in terms of just, like, finding this business, developing her business, like, finding people when she couldn't do a thing, finding someone else who could do that thing, like, being able to be this, like, sorceress entrepreneur for 20 years and not get in trouble, even though it was, like, everything she did was very against the law. 
I think her scheminess is also very high. I'm going to give her, I don't know, you know, I feel like Madame de Montespan is like a 10 scheminess because she's the one who like hired her for the amatory masses. Catherine is more just like did what she did, practical choices. I'm going to give her 7.5 for scheminess. Her significance is, so this is the thing. This is where I think her score may not be super high because she was certainly a major figure in the Affair of the Poisons. She was the linchpin of this kind of like secret Paris underground magical community. She really made that all happen. And then the Affair of the Poisons was investigating that. But the fact that it's so hard to find information about her, like she was implicated, she was involved, but like if she hadn't been there doing as much as she did... I feel like someone else would have been there being maybe not as talented, like Marie Boss or whatever. Like the whole thing wasn't investigated because of her. She didn't make them investigate. She wasn't even the first person they investigated. She was very famous. I feel that she's a significant role model to people who want to be grifters and or women entrepreneurs in an era where that's hard. But I, I have to say her significance is pretty low. I'm going to give her mm, five for significance. And then the sexism bonus. So in the sense of living in a situation where women had no power at all, she was able to use that to her advantage in some ways. Like she wasn't able to leave her husband and that's sex and the patriarchy. She helped out women despite the sexism of the era like i don't know i think like she was arrested for all this stuff she was executed but like so were men also like i don't think she was specifically villainized herself like she was treated very badly because she was a poor woman i mean i'm gonna give her the the default five like it's not like there wasn't sexism was part of her story but i feel like it wasn't a major part of her story. So what does that, that's a 20, 27.5 for, let's see. Oh, you know who else is a 27.5? Mary Tudor um, is the only one with a 27.5 as well. People with 27s, Francis Gray, Catherine Parr, Jean de Lamotte, who I feel like spiritually, the story is very similar. Isabella of Castile, Margaret Pohl, Anna de Mendoza, also, the eye patch. How cool is she? Isabel of Portugal, 27. So this 27 is like a pretty average score, which I think is good. And I'm, again, extremely grateful for the, the books that I found. So I was able to find enough information about her to actually give her a score and talk about her life there a little bit. So, yeah, I'm just going to mention them again because the books were like challenging to find but they can be found. So The Affair of the Poisons, Murder, Infanticide, and Satanism at the Court of Louis XIV by Anne Somerset, and then Strange Revelations, Magic, Poison, and Sacrilege in Louis XIV's France by Lynn Wood Molenauer. I will not put, I can't, I would. I can't put links to them in the show notes because these books are literally not available to buy um, except for from used stores, but I'll put their titles there so you can find them if you want to really dig into all this stuff. And... Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. You can, let's see, all the things. So I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Ann Foster writer. That is where, so for instance, it was from Patreon that it was decided they voted and chose La Voisin as a subject for this episode. And I feel like, thank you, Patreons. Great choice. I learned a lot from researching it and it's I'm excited to learn more about the Affair of the Poisons. I'm, I'm excited to read the rest of these books, not just the love was at parts. Um, anyway, so if you join the Patreon for as little as $1 a month, so you get early access to episodes of Vulgar History for that amount. If you pledge at least $2 a month, you get to vote in polls. And if you pledge at least $5 a month, then you get, I do every month, even when the podcast isn't on, I do a special bonus episode called So This Asshole about some man who is awful and after all of this i feel like louis the 14th might pop up and sew this asshole 
So that's all on Patreon. Uh, there's also the store, vulgarhistory.store, vulgarhistory.store. If you buy anything from there, like for instance, the new Tits Out Brigade merch, um, you can use code Tits Out for free shipping in the US or Tits Out 10, Tits Out 10 for 10% off if you're not in the US. And yeah, Instagram is at Vulgar History Pod. I'm on Twitter at Vulgar History. And yeah, so I just, these are the three little Halloween episodes we did. And don't despair. There's not going to be vulgar history for a minute. But then in mid-November, I've got a super special episode planned for November. I think you're going to find it really exciting. And I can't wait to share it with you. And so until then, keep your mask on and your tits out. I'm Laura Cathcart-Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today. Nowadays, trends and news cycles change faster than we can blink. But there are some things that withstand the test of time. And if you're looking for a connection to something timeless, and maybe also a glimpse of life at a slower pace, I believe everyone can relate to the very human experiences explored in Jane Austen's novels. And that's where I come in. My name is Alison Larkin. I'm a writer, comedian, and narrator and host of The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin. I spent a lot of my childhood in the part of England where Jane Austen lived and wrote, and now that I live in the States, nothing gives me a sense of homecoming quite like narrating her books. On this show, you'll listen to award-winning narration. I'll give myself a pat on the back for that as well as conversations with actors, writers and other fascinating people who all share a passionate love for Jane Austen. So please, join me as we embark on a wonderful journey through Jane Austen's work. Be sure to listen and subscribe to The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.